Honorable President of Republic of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, sir, officials of the Rastapati Nivas, INDAs, officer trainees of 215 batch, officers of Royal Oil Authority Bhutan, good morning and warm welcome to all of you. Respected sir, National Academy of Audit Accounts, the INDAs officers training institute Shimla is grateful for providing 2015 batch INDAs officer trainees the privilege of calling, calling on the President of India. These young officers of 2015 batch are economically very qualified and have come from different states and have, are from diverse social economic background. So the training is nearly for two years duration. We have 15 months residential training at Academy in two phases. This two years training includes eight months practical training in the AG offices in different states. To be professional public sector auditor, apart from accounts, financial management, financial reporting, auditing, public expenditure management, revenue management, we also, they also need to be familiar with the nuances of public administration. At Academy, we also expose them to the challenges faced by the bureaucracy that implements the public policies. At the end of two years training, they emerge as professionals in the public sector auditing, equipped to fulfill the role assigned to the public sector auditing by the Constitution of India. The Academy for Training at INDS Offices at Shimla was set up by the first C and AG, Sri V. Narhari Rao, at Shimla in 1950. Since then, 65 batches were trained. All of them diligently served and are serving the Indian Audit Accounts Department, contributing to the improvement to governance. So the Academy constantly endeavors to improve its functions by imbibing best practices in the field. It has very specialized curriculum and course content for the purpose of auditing. Among the institutions that provide training on the public sector auditing and accounting in the world, including developed countries, the Academy at Simla is perhaps the best. The National Academy of Audit Accounts is proud to present these young officers, trainees to the President of India. This opportunity for 2015 batch officers to listen to and seek blessings from the head of our republic is a very special occasion for the Academy, which you're looking forward to. Thank you and welcome you all. Thank you, sir. The 2015 batch has spent a couple of months in the academy. They have had their regular classroom sessions and other activities that are part of their induction training. Two officer trainees, Rajan Shyam and Hariram Shankar, would share their experiences so far in the academy. I first request Rajan Shyam to share his experiences. Honorable President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee, Director General of the National Academy of Audit and Accounts, Officials of the Rashtrapati Bhavan, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to narrate the training experiences of our batch in this magnificent place. We pulled up in the National Academy of Audit and Accounts on a wintry December evening. We had had lively discussions on what to expect at the Academy. Our expectations were met by soft amber lights, stone tiles, and artistic metal chairs painted white. As we heaved down our luggage, the cottage vibe, boarding school chatter, and the courteous staff mingled in the clean and cold air. This was to be our residence, popularly called Yarrows. The atmosphere was impressive, welcoming, and reassuring. Cut to the classrooms and the words that spring to mind are thoughtful and organized. As we descend the 160 steps from Yarrows to our classrooms, the gray slate and quartzite roof of the academy first comes in view. Next comes the motto inscribed beneath the front arch, Lok Hitarth Satyanishta. The classes themselves were a motley mix of group activities, guest lectures, and core curriculum. As we climb back the steps to arrows, our minds often rummage through the contents of the classes. Thoughts ranged from apples being introduced in Shimla by the Philadelphian Quaker Samuel Stokes, to the elasticity of demand and supply in microeconomics, to the minor head of a budget depicting a certain program. The basics of both subjects and of conduct were repeatedly emphasized. Perhaps it was in the hope that it would trickle down to our minds and have an effect on our behavior. Here, I'd like to take the opportunity to say that it has certainly raised the quality of public debate happening within us. Apart from the lovely academy and thoughtful classes, what often makes training the most memorable aspect of any officer's career is the team and the spirit that drives it. In the morning walk, which starts with a groggy group making their way in the morning mist and ends with sprightly lads ready to take on the day, in the weekend treks where sun rays sparkle through the foliage, peaks watch over us majestically, as we push ourselves in undulating lines with stops for sing songs and panorama photos, during games, calling to each other and at the same time competing with each other, in running the hostel mess, in organizing official parties and festivals, 
and as a group rushing to meet assignment deadlines. In all these, a spirit decor was nurtured. From here on, I can sense the remaining part of the training stretch out in front of me like the Valley of Glen. The experiences that await us include getting a glimpse of monetary policy from RBI, management training from IIM Ahmedabad, and environmental audit training from the International Center in Jaipur. There is time yet to revel in the serene environs of the academy, time yet to spend on meaningful attachments. Towards the end of the training, I hope we would be able to say, in joyful regret, like Chris Christopherson, isn't it kind of funny, isn't it just the way though, aren't we getting better running out of time? Thank you. Let me now request my colleague, Sri Hariram Shankar, to continue the narrative. Honorable President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee, sir, other dignitaries and my dear friends, it is a dream come true for me to be in the very building where India was built brick by brick. Hence, I think it is apt to describe how our training is building us brick by brick. At the academy, we officer trainees were pleasantly delighted to learn that both academic and non-academic aspects are nurtured equally. One might say that IA and AS training has taken a leaf out of the Shanti Nikedan way of learning. I vividly remember an advice one of our directors once said. At the end of training, what you will take home is not government accounts or auditing principles. Rather, it would be discipline and teamwork and empathy for the people you, who you are working for, the common man. We learned this through our daily trek into the Sedar wilderness of Shimla. We learned this by running a crutch for the children of migrant laborers. Nothing else but humility can explain the extent to which our academy takes care of its staff. Recently, we officer trainees along with directors celebrated the birthday of a staff who had long served at the academy in various capacities. On the way back, he told me, I have served here for a major part of my life. What makes me want to stay here longer is the warmth and respect I receive from officers generation after generation. I know they need not do that for me, but yet they do. It is true that humility and egalitarian attitude has been and always will be the core of our value system. The academy and training so far reminded us that we are indeed servants of the society. To enrich our experience with the best diversity our society can offer, in the short span of a month, we have already celebrated Pongal and Lodi with joy and laughter and revelry. At our training, we are taught not merely to accept diversity, but to embrace it and make it part of our identity. Our colleagues, officer trainees from Royal Audit Authority Bhutan, are an integral and inseparable part of our batch. This is probably the most important element in the personality of every civil servant in a multi-ethnic and multicultural society like India. We are indeed turning into Swami Vivekananda's dream of men with nerves of steel, and we are ready to walk in the path of truth, even if it means we have to walk alone. On the altar of India's sovereignty, the Rashtrapati Bhavan, we are proudly declaring that we are now well on the way to be fully equipped to uphold the constitutional duty that has been bestowed on us, and will strive to the best of our abilities to see the nation achieve greater feats. Thank you. As a token of our respect, I request the Director General to present the Honorable President with the memento of Yaros, the home of the officer trainees. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you, including the representative of the Royal Bhutan Audit Authority, to this historic building, which has witnessed many contemporary political events, which have not only affected this great country, its neighbors, but in fact, large part of the world. At one point of time, this was the seat of power, which administered a very vast territory, including whole of India, undivided. That means India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Sri Lanka was then part of India, known as Shilon at that time, 
what is known as Myanmar. At that time, it was known as Burma, Singapore, and up to Aden in the Gulf. Territorial jurisdiction of the British Governor General from 1919 to 1947, till the partition of India, comprised these territories. Later on, of course, many of these became independent sovereign states like Singapore, <coughs> Myanmar or Burma, Ceylon or Sri Lanka, etc. The service to which you belong to is also a very old service. Of, in the history of 190 years of the British rule in India, first 100 years from 1757 to 1857, the British government and king decided to leave the day-to-day -day administration to a mercantile company which came to India for trading known as East India Company from 1774 to 1857. They administered on behalf of the sovereign of United Kingdom, Great Britain, after 1857, the first revolt of the Indian people against the colonial rule, they decided to have the administration directly and appointed the governor general. Earlier also the post of governor general was there, but they were of course, with the approval of the British sovereign appointed, but they were appointed by the board of directors of the East India Company. 1858 onwards, Governor General was directly appointed by the British King or Queen. And thereafter, the British government started structuring the administration with modern flavor and modern systems. One of the very first acts they passed, it was in 1861, they established the institution of the Auditor and Accountant General of India. As finance minister at that point of time, in 2011, I celebrated 150 years of the establishment of this organization. There is a long history, I am not going into that part, but the name of Comptroller and Auditor General was introduced by the Constitution in 1950. And 70s, the accounts part and the auditing part were separated. And I still remember, as junior minister in the Ministry of Finance, I had the privilege of piloting that bill in one house of the parliament. What is your job? Once I had to observe that this is in office which is maintained and its entire expenditure is borne by the government of India from its treasury to criticize, to point out the pitfalls, to find out the lapses, and to tell parliament through the report of the 
CAG, and also to tell the state legislative assembly through the report of the accountant general of the state annually when they examined the vast financial transactions of the government, federal government of India, and various state governments, currently which are 29. It is mind-boggling figure. When country became independent in 1947, the first budget of independent India, which was presented by the then finance minister, Shanmukham Chetty, you will laugh at the figure. The total revenue budget was 293 crores of rupees. I'm sorry, 297 crores of rupees, of which 271 crore is the income of the government of India, 116 crores from income tax, which is an old tax, 50 crores rupees, 51 crores, from customs duty, and there was a very peculiar tax at that point of time. It was imposed on imported alcohol, and the amount was very small. It was roughly about two and a half to three crores of rupees. That was the total income of the government of India. And the expenditure was 290, seven crores, and the balance 26 crores was known, which is called in modern economic term as the deficit financing. And the budget, current year's budget I can't tell, only finance minister and his team knows, which will be presented on 29th February. But last year's budget, Total budgetary transaction of the federal government alone was 16 lakh crores of rupees. Deficit in the initial days was 26 crores of rupees, and today it runs of the 16 lakh crores of rupees government's own income through revenue and various other things after distribution to the <coughs> component states, revenue will be about roughly 10 lakh crores, and 6 lakh crores is the borrowing. This is only federal government. You are to add to the because you are directly responsible for looking into these huge financial transactions and whether it is as per the financial rules which you will be trained and which as the trained officers you will be doing throughout your life in the next 30, 35 years. So that is the responsibility. But one may come to the conclusion that perhaps it is the total negative rule. No. You also have to contribute. As your director general pointed out, that you are an instrument, a cog in the big wheel, to provide good governance, to provide Welfare government, which always looks at the welfare of the people, it's no longer a police state where the only three jobs were left to the government. Rest of the things were done by individuals or society. That is defense to protect the border, to maintain law and order, 
and to dispense justice. When the states were formed in the course of his civilization of human history, these were the three main jobs and functions. It was whatever you may call, earlier days it was community, thereafter it was king or royalty, and thereafter now we talk of democracy, which is run by the people, for the people, consists of the people. Therefore, this is not totally negative, it is also has a positive aspect. The second point which I would like to tell you, I congratulate you for choosing this public service after passing a very difficult competitive examination and by any standard which is considered as one of the most difficult competitive examination in the world. Not only you belong to a very old traditional service by passing through a very difficult competitive examination, but equally important point to be underlined that at such young age, you will have the tremendous responsibility which, except the public service, in no other service you will get. The amount of responsibility which a young officer, after coming out of the academy, going through rigorous trainings for IS training 158, 358 weeks, and thereafter some other type of trainings. Yours is clearly two years first, and thereafter other various trainings. But that is not the end of your learning. Learning is a process which you shall have to keep in mind in the language of our father of nations, Mahatma Gandhi, that you learn with this mode that you are going to live for ever. That means throughout your life you shall have to learn. So you will learn in your academy, you will learn in your first assignment, and in course of your long career of 30, 35 years, you will find that there is no end of learning. Nowadays, we are providing various type of exposures and facilities to our young civil servants. Because you are the eyes and ears of the government. Persons like us who come and uh, channel the political executives. Most of the times we are raw materials, particularly when we enter into as a young MP or as a junior minister. And always there is a saying that rate of mortality is very high in the realm of parliamentary politics. Average life of an Indian parliament or Indian parliamentarian is seven and a half years. Average life of an Indian minister from 1947 till date, it is two, two and a half years. Of course, there are exceptions, including me. I used to tell in my later days in the parliament that I have become an antique piece in the parliamentary structure of country because I have served parliament 
for nearly four decades and have served government of India as minister for quarter century. But average rate of mortality is very high in India. Therefore, from that point of view, you are the permanent basic structures not basic features, but you are the permanent basic structure of the civil service through which government of India or all government operates. There is a famous saying, Thomas Kempis has once observed, and I quote it, the loftier the building, the deeper must the foundation be laid. So you shall have to always keep in mind that this structure is loftier, but it is loftier and lasting because of the deep foundation laid. Democratic system of this country will be laid by and you will play a very major role because considerable time of parliament is spent and rightly so because the major critical issues cannot be debated and discussed openly in the, on the floor of the house with 543 members. Therefore, the committee system has evolved. One of the most important committees is the Public Accounts Committee. And India is fortunate to have this parliamentary institution long before even the independence. In 1921, we are very shortly, we will celebrate the centenary of the PAC. Public Accounts Committee was established in India. Parliamentary independence was initiated by the then British speakers. Though our power of legislation, power of representation was very limited, but that's part of the history. The short point which I'm trying to drive at, always you shall have to keep in your mind that your major job would be to help the parliament, help the legislative assembly, their representatives, to understand the financial transactions intricacies, rules in details, at least to the members of the Public Accounts Committee. Because CAG or his deputy is the eyes and ears of these committees. Volumes of reports come. Nowadays, of course, facilities are much more and technological innovations have helped us. But nonetheless, you will have to work in details, look into it, always remember the financial rules, elaborate arrangements were made. And there is also a history, small history, why this organization was established. Because to their utter surprise and also dismay, the members of the board of directors of East India Company found out, after a vast track of Indian empire was acquired by them, that they are extremely corrupt. They are minting money at the expense of their employer. That is East India Company. So they wanted to have the check and balance. And to wanted to have the check on the profligacy of the company's employees and administrations. Initially it was meant. So the initial financial rules were very presumption that the man is dishonest. And therefore, he is to follow strictly 
the rules so that he cannot indulge in dishonesty or profiteering at the expense of the public part. But the basic fundamental principle remains that nobody can benefit illegally, unlawfully, at the cost of the public fund, which means the trust of public reposed on it. I welcome you to the service. I do hope all of you one day will rise to the pinnacle of your service. I also welcome the very distinguished guests of us representing the Royal Audit Department of Bhutan. I wish you very successful tenure of yours in your long career. Thank you, young men.